Okay, and we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Elise Fry. I am the Test Administration and Formative Assessment Specialist with USBE. Um, just so that you're aware, also joining us on Zoom, we have other members of our USBE team, as well as some members from our CAI team with RISE, who are here to help answer any questions you may have and monitor the chat. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're gonna go through um, the RISE portal today and just look at the types of tests provided, how to access the resources which accompany these tests, like the TAM, uh, the RISE TIDE user guide. We'll go through TIDE, and then we're also gonna look at TDS, the administration interface, as well as some reporting. Um, when finished, hopefully you feel more comfortable training the users in your LEA, as well as providing support for them as needed. Um, just as a heads up for you, this training is being recorded and will be posted to our assessment YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to share the recording link with you as well during next uh, uh, next week's AD meeting. Uh, and then we will also include in, we'll include that link in the upcoming memo the next few weeks as well. Um, I will also get with Emily Ng, our support specialist in the next couple of days to be able to share this slide deck out with you so that you have access to it as well. So to begin, if you're not currently receiving portal updates from RISE, I would encourage you to subscribe on the RISE portal. You just go to utahrise.org and then click the second button at the bottom of the screen to do that. Once you've registered, you'll receive email notifications whenever resources are updated or if an announcement is posted, uh, posted to the portal. Within the RISE system, there are four types of tests provided through the portal. And we're gonna look at each of them individually in a bit. Uh, but first we're gonna talk a little bit about their availability. So the training tests are always available and we're gonna go over their importance a little bit later. Um, the benchmark module availability is almost your entire school year. This year, uh, as has been mentioned in the previous AD meetings, as well as many AD memos, the RISE math and interim assessments, as well as the benchmark modules, uh, are working currently to be enhanced to provide more standards-based information. So their availability is slightly different than the other content areas. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the benchmark modules, these are a tool for teachers to use with students to focus on specific strands within the Utah core standards. They are fixed form assessments that are designed to give teachers and students an opportunity to identify strengths and weaknesses uh, in regard to specific knowledge or skills and abilities as outlined in the Utah core standards. The benchmark modules can be taken multiple times uh, if you're looking to show growth, but know that participation is not required. It is local decision. Uh, student results are only provided for LEA and school use. We don't collect those here at USBE, okay? A list of available benchmark modules is available on the RISE portal, but keep in mind, as you're using these, they're also not meant to be predictive of how students will perform on the RISE summative. Also, for those who are interested, some of the benchmark modules are permitted to be administered remotely using the secure browser. For a list of those, you'll want to see the benchmark module directory that's linked here on the portal. And the results for these are reported as raw scores, meaning that the points are received based on questions answer answered correctly. These results can be shared with students and teachers can review classroom level responses in a whole class setting, uh, but considerations need to be made to protect PII or the like student name, uh, those types of things, and then how to provide instruction for students. Um, you just need to make sure that you're maintaining the security of those items. So teachers can't copy or paste or photograph test questions or prompts into other presentations or record themselves sharing student responses. Um, more information can be found in the TAM, but if you're interested in how best to share information with students, you can reach out to me directly and I can provide you with a little more guidance with that as well. When it comes to the RISE interim assessments, these are also optional. Participation in these assessments is strictly determined locally, like the benchmark modules, student results are provided for LEA and school use, and students may participate in one grade level interim per subject in the fall, and then one again in the winter. The interim assessments are adaptive, meaning different questions are given to students based on previously answered questions. So the results of interim assessments can, uh, can be predictive 
of summative performance. Uh, just to know, though, it is not recommended that students that schools um, administer both benchmark modules and interims assessments because they share a bank. So just know that if you are administering an interim and a benchmark, the, some of those questions may cross over. Okay. Similar to the benchmarks, though, the results are reported with a scale score and proficiency levels can be shared with students. You can review those classroom level responses in a whole class setting. But again, as long as those considerations are made to keep items um, as secure as possible. Again, more guidance is in the TAM if you're interested, or you can reach out to me directly and I can provide more guidance for you as well. For the RISE summative assessments, these are designed to assess the knowledge, skills, and abilities described in the core standards um, for ELA, writing in two grades, five and eight, and then math and science, okay? Blueprints are provided on the portal, but the summative items and stimuli are uh, not able to be reviewed with students or discussed as a class or reviewed during instructional conversations once completed. Remote administration will be provided this year for summative assessments in ELA, math, and writing, for students who receive 100% of their instruction online. So if a student is enrolled in a brick and mortar building for any course, they are still going to be expected to test in person. Um, also, no science tests will be uh, administered remotely this year. Uh, more information is provided in the TAM. There will also be a specific remote administration held in the coming weeks for LEAs who may be interested. Um, just note that the remote training is going to focus on strictly that, the remote aspects of the RISE administration. Uh, so it's meant to be used like in conjunction with this particular training. It's just going to focus on those remote administration pieces that are going to differ from an in-person administration. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, it's important to note that even with the parameters of the testing windows that you set, that uh, these testing opportunities expire. If the test opportunity isn't completed within the allotted time frame, it's going to expire, meaning that the student no longer has access to make any changes. So if a test expires and the student needs to access it again, you will have, uh, you'll need to file a test request appeal. If you work as an assessment director, it's your responsibility to approve or deny those appeal requests. More information on how that is, uh, how, how to go about doing that is provided in the TIDE user guide. And we'll go over the process in greater detail during our winter training to prep for the summative administration. But one thing to note here is there's really no need to file an appeal for an expired benchmark module because the student can just start a new testing opportunity if it expires. All right, so the importance of training tests. Why training tests? What have your experience has been using or not using <laughs> the training tests? Feel free to come off mute or drop experiences in the chat. Why, like, what are some success stories or challenges that you have faced with these? I, I like that they give all sorts of types of problems or questions, you know, the different manipulatives, it forces the kids to get practice and everything. Um, the harder thing is because it's not in the secure test browser, they kind of can deviate and go other places during them. <clears throat> okay. You can actually give a training test using the secure browser, and I'll show you how to do that as well. It, it's an option, but it, I like though that you touched on the fact that you don't have to use the secure browser because that's sometimes a hindrance. People go, well, we don't have the secure browser at home. You know, why would I want to look at a training test with my student or why would I want to show this to parents? It, it is a it's they are public facing. You can most definitely do that. So I like that you actually touched on that. Um, a few things in the chat. Yes, it helps students become familiar with the platform. You can teach your students how to use the tools that will help them be successful in a really low stakes environment. I love that. It really is the best way to familiarize ourselves and our students with the functionality of the system. Um, as Keith mentioned, it provides various item types that they get exposure to all different types of uh, questions. It allows you to practice administration procedures as well as practice with those global tools that Lauren mentioned in the chat. Um, it allows you to ensure your local technology configurations are validated 
to ensure that the summative assessment can be administered. Okay, it's just a, it's just a good idea to give the training tests in all uh, presented content areas as well, as some components are more content specific, like the calculator or lack thereof, <laughs> because the math test is only provided with a calculator for one segment on grade six and then seven and eight. Our lower grades aren't provided with a calculator, okay? But they might see the calculator on a science test and wonder why it's there. Uh, and Tracy's dropped in the chat that accommodation should be practiced in the training tests. And that's a really great um, reason to use the secure browser version because the students' accommodations can be applied and used um, through, that, uh, through that avenue. Uh, let's see, we also have a question. Can a teacher show the benchmark test whole class and use it as training that way? Uh, no, the benchmark test should not be projected as a whole class training. You can do that with your training test, and then you could project your benchmark reporting after it's been completed. Does that provide more clarification? Okay, perfect. So the training tests are provided through the portal. They do not require RISE login credentials, although if you are using the secure browser, those RISE login credentials would be required, okay? If you haven't taken a training test, I would recommend taking some time following this training or in the next couple of days uh, and take one. Use the guest user access that's provided. It's gonna give you a similar experience to what teachers and students experience. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, if you're looking at them for the first time with students, just know that may take a little bit longer as you are all orient orienting yourselves with where tools are and how they work, so on, things like that. Um, and also science tests might take a little bit longer as the cluster format with multiple questions using the same stimulus material sometimes takes a little bit of getting used to as well. So the two different ways to take a training test are included here. The training test option is the public guest login option and is very simple. For this option, you select the training test option with a proc without a proctor, and then you just sign in. This is great for teachers and staff to familiarize themselves with the, what the platform looks like um, and functions. It can also be used as an, as an informative tool for parents if they have any questions as to what it might look like for students. Or you can administer a training test in a test session. This would mirror the RISE process, which requires logging credentials, a valid session ID, as well as the secure browser, okay? These are far more useful when prepping for test administration because using the RISE logging credentials better mirrors the whole RISE summative process. If you've been taking advantage of the interim assessments or the benchmark modules, you've been able to practice this login process as well. Um, if you choose to try this type of experience, be sure to select the test administration option in the preparing for testing section. Um, using this option also allows you to verify any accommodations like Tracy had mentioned, which are set for students uh, prior to taking the assessment who might need those services. Um, we'll also go into more detail regarding accommodations later, but know that that has to be set for each student prior to the student signing into the secure browser for those accommodations to be available for them. From there, you're going to select your grade level as well as the training test you wish to take. Note that these are grade banded. The content is not single grade specific. It's important to help students and teachers understand that content mastery is not the purpose of the training test. The purpose is to become familiar with the system itself and the tools that are provided. Uh, the training tests are used to verify the accommodations and ensure resources are applied and work correctly prior to taking the assessments. This is where you would see any accommodations that may have been assigned in tied to individual student accounts. Okay. Also within the training test, there are scoring assertions that are provided to give feedback on students' responses um, with scoring criteria. And you see these um, in science specifically. Uh, the training test also has Spanish adaptive functionality. Guidance for accessing training tests with Spanish enabled is as follows. 
you'll go to the training test, sign in, select your grade and either the math or science training test. There is not an ELA test provided in, in Spanish. In the choose settings screen under presentation, you'll select Spanish from the language drop down. And from this point on, the screen's contents are going to switch to Spanish. And once in the testing environment, the student can toggle between Spanish and English content after entering the training test. And the little change language toggle button becomes one of the global menu tools in the upper right corner. It looks like the little earth. And I've got a little screenshot for it there. Um, it's important to note that the use of the Spanish adaptive functionality on Windows devices does require that the, sp uh, the Spanish voice pack be installed. So you want to complete these steps to verify that that's done before a student starts a training test if you are expecting them to be able to take it um, with the Spanish adaptive functionality. The secure browser is also required for administering all benchmark, interim, and summative assessments. As mentioned before, you can also use it to administer training tests, although it's not required. Um, instructions for installation are in the technology resources link found under the resources section of the RISE portal. Uh, the RISE secure browser needs to be installed on devices prior to students taking any summative assessment. So make sure you refer to the supported browsers before um, updating any system um, prior to testing as well. If you have issues with the secure browser on a device, um, you'll wanna reach out to your technology specialist. There are also troubleshooting guides for various operating systems in the technology resources provided on the portal. So at this point, do we have any questions regarding RISE availability windows, the training tests, or the secure browser before we move forward? Feel free to come off mute or drop them in the chat if you have any questions related to these three topics. So at least we're, we're planning on doing the interim tests this year. So would your recommendation then be do, you know, one of each of the training tests and make sure you log into those so that you make sure the kids or the students have the login um, and don't. So, again, not doing any of the benchmarks. Yes. Yeah. If you're going to take the interim, I would recommend not doing the benchmarks and the training test. You can do it either way with the secure browser or like you had mentioned with the guest login. The secure browser, though, is going to make it so students can't navigate right. away from the page. So, and it provides them the opportunity to test their login credentials. Right. That, that, that's so what I was it just, saying. Yeah. It mirrors the process a little bit better. But like if you're in a hurry, if you've done it a few different times, the guest user login is still there and available. Okay. And then, so, and then with the, the interim, you said there's no science and no, uh, what was the other? It's just going to be math and language arts. Is that right? So for, in for interns, yes, there's math and language arts. And then there are benchmarks provided for other content areas, though, if you wanted to. Use okay. Those. Okay. Um, question in the chat. Let's see here. Did you say that benchmarks need to be administered in a secure browser? Yes, the benchmarks need to be um, administered with a secure browser. Interim tests to clarify, they can take one subject in fall, one subject in winter. Um, Rachel, meaning like I can take the math test once in fall and I can take math again in winter. So I can take each content area, but only one time in each season. Does that help? And yes, interim tests are designed to be more predictive or indicative of a summative. Can the RISE browser be downloaded on a Chromebook that students own personally? Uh, yes, Rachel, it can. There's guidance provided there in the um, tech resources. Did I miss anyone? Okay. Okay, wait, can I ask one? So yeah, wait, on the test, so there's the two windows. If, if, and they could take both the math and language arts in that in each window correct? yes yes but they could take both of them in both windows yes i just can't take two math tests in the fall yeah okay and would the would the two interim tests would they be different in the fall and then the winter 
or is it going to so be kind of the same? The interims are adaptive. So there is no guarantee that the student okay. will see the same, the same items. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So on to the RISE portal. Here's a quick overview of what each of the separate sections provides. You'll see there's five different tabs to choose from, along with an abbreviated version of what you'll find or be able to do in each of those sections. We're going to start today with the resources. The resources tab houses the tech resources previously mentioned, as well as other helpful user guides like the TIDE user guide, the test administration manual, as well as the RISE reporting guide. To find these, you just select the user guide folder under browse. There are lots of other available resources you can browse through like the benchmark module directory, the writing rubrics, blueprints, all sorts of things, but we're gonna focus on the available user guides since those are really, they're like the bread and butter for test administration. We're not gonna be able to go over all of these components, uh, but this gives you an idea of where to look if you need to access the information. So the TIDE user guide is where you'll take care of all accounts. It's where you'll add accommodations for students who require them, as well as monitoring test participation. It also outlines the um, appeals process for school administrators and LEA level users. The TAM or the Test Administration Manual has the step-by-step -step processes outlined for how teachers administer tests, how students take tests. Um, it also contains the scripting that's required to read prior to administration. Um, I would recommend that anyone who's administering a test familiarize themselves with TDS and the script sections prior to RISE administration, just to alleviate any confusion which could occur um, if that practice isn't followed. Also, for what it's worth, the TAM is designed to allow for printing relevant sections by role. So teachers don't need to print the whole thing. They can really just focus on the specific sections that are applicable to what they are doing. The reporting guide includes all the information needed to access your reports once students have completed testing. Uh, this is important for benchmark modules, interim assessments, and some of assessments. Um, and just know that there's no reporting for training tests, so you're not going to find anything there because training tests do not provide reporting. The second menu tab is the benchmark module preview system. It's available to all users except students who are registered in TIDE. Um, this system allows users to preview all benchmark modules available at any time to determine um, the appropriate instructional use in a classroom. Just know that it's not appropriate to use the benchmark module preview system to review benchmark modules with students or to copy any items into another format. Okay, only authorized RISE account users are even going to be able to access them. Okay, the benchmark module previewing option is not public facing. Directions for how to review the benchmark modules in the preview system are found in the TAM in the RISE benchmark Pro module preview system section. Okay, once you've logged in and select the module you wish to preview, you'll be able to toggle between the questions, view any stimuli associated with the questions, like a reading passage. Um, again, this is not to be used for instructional or practice purposes. This is only for teachers to determine which benchmark modules would bet this fit their classroom. Okay. So now we're going to look at TIDE. TIDE stands for Test Information Distribution Engine. When you select the TIDE option, you're going to be prompted to log in with your credentials. Once you log in, the TIDE homepage is going to appear. The TIDE homepage reflects the stages of the testing process. So if you look at this, you can see there's a preparing section and an administering section, as well as an after section. Um, another important note here is that that blue after testing section is for LEA level users only. So if you're a teacher or a testing coordinator, you're only going to see the first orange and green sections. Okay. Um, I also want to draw your attention to some changes here. There's now a waffle menu on the left hand side, which allows you to switch between applications like the reporting system and TDS where you administer tests. The secure inbox has been replaced by the secure file center. And this is where you can access secure documents and student data files that you've previously exported from TIDE, um, as well as download or archive, delete any other uh, previously exported files. Um, permissions for accessing data and viewing other information in TIDE 
is determined by your user role. And there's six different roles. Each of those roles have different permissions associated with them. This screenshot from the Tide User Guide gives you an idea of how those permissions break down. So for example, a district or LEA level user may be able to perform tasks that are not available to a school level user. So you can see here that LEA and school administrators are granted more permissions than teachers or proctors are okay, within the system. Permissions also limit the scope of data access. A district level user is going to be able to view and work with data pertaining to the district, the schools associated with the district, as well as individual teachers associated with the district. While a school level user is only going to be able to work with data pertaining to that school, okay? Or even just their assigned rosters if it's a teacher level um, account. Uh, so now we're gonna look at each of these sections individually and we're gonna start with preparing testing or that orange section. So here you can view um, and edit user accounts as well as add new users. Um, the student dropdown will allow you to access and edit student accounts like adding accommodations, as well as uploading student settings or creating a free, the frequency distribution reports. We'll go over that a little bit later. Okay. Whenever you're accessing student information, the results can be exported to your secure file center we touched on earlier on the Tide homepage. This allows for larger result tables and they can export as Excel files or as CSV files. Um, this is a demo student record and gives you an idea of what an individual student record might look like. The student information used to search is displayed at the top, while the student participation is displayed on the bottom. You can view individual settings by clicking the edit pencil that's there on the left. Clicking that icon allows you to see assessments and benchmark modules that the student has already participated in, or if there are parental exclusions associated with the student as well as you can um, view or set student test settings and accommodations. This also includes the new Spanish adaptive option for summative assessments, okay? Now, in an effort to not have to travel backward through the slides, this is kind of an all call for how to set accommodations for students within the RISE system. So if you're multitasking, stop what you're doing and tune in if you need help setting accommodations because now is the time. <laughs> Okay, so to set accommodations for students who need them, you will click on that little pencil icon there that's on the left. This is going to take you to the student test screen, which looks like this. And I know it's small print, but once you click on that pencil icon, you'll notice that there are separate menus which will expand or condense based on the little plus or minus button on the left. If you look at the very top, there are student, uh, there's the student information and the student participation menus. Those have not been expanded in this particular screenshot. Okay. Um, I've chosen to expand the visual assistance tools, presentation, uh, integration with assistive technology, and other accommodations menus. So you can see that this is where you set all of those. To do so, you just use the series of drop down menus and toggle switches to make changes to the assistance tools, um, the presentation modifications like Braille, ASL, print on request, assistive technology, all of the other accommodations that would be outlined in IEPs or 504 documents, okay? Accommodations are not uploaded through the Scram or Utrecht sync. You need to do it within the system. They're taken care of manually in this section, okay? This is also where you can set the Spanish adaptive feature for the summative assessment. Uh, yeah, George, we'll look at that in just a little bit here. This slide, in fact, <laughs> to apply the Spanish adaptive feature, you're going to select Spanish under math and or science under those two test families, depending on what's determined by your language team. Once you select those, you click save. Okay, we've developed recommendations for students who we feel would benefit most from the Spanish adaptive version of the summative assessment. Uh, these recommendation guidelines are provided in the TAM. It's important to note that the decision uh, ultimately needs to be determined by your LEA's language services team with support of the parent and student preference, okay? Uh, does Spanish need to be added as an accommodation or is it something any student can access? It is added just like, just right here as an accommodation, 
Is there a deadline for accommodations? That is, do they have to be entered before a certain time frame? Cami, you just want to have them entered before the student enters the system. Um, if Tracy or Jessica have any more guidance for that, they're welcome to come off mute and provide it. Um, the only thing I would say, Elise, would be if a student needs assistive technology um, or if they're using, um, they want the embedded dictation or word predict, that gets turned on by the state. So they have to submit that request, but I'm assuming you'll go over that. Yeah, that'll that'll come up here in just a little bit. But thanks for touching on it. That's good. Uh, yes, Spanish is. Uh, I, my, sorry, my my only other thing here. This can get a little bit confusing because you'll see in Elisa's screenshot. If you have students using Braille, you go into that. This is where you do the Braille also. So that can get a little bit funky. Um, and then you have to indicate the the Braille type that a student is using, and that's below. Um, you indicate their Braille type, and then you have to turn the print on request on as well. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, back to the chat here. Will the Spanish Adaptive create a second test record this year if the student logs out and setting has changed? Uh, Amanda, that's a great question. Do I have a CAI member who can answer that? I think it will, but I wanna be sure. If they can't answer straight away, Amanda, you can send me an email, but I'm thinking it's still going to create the second test like it did last year. Yeah, and Annalise, this is Kim, and I would say that not only is it supposed to do that, but the it is up to the schools to be creating their Spanish, the Spanish language is an accommodation, just like another kind of accommodation. Um, and so um, they need to make sure that the student has practiced with it prior to going on and using it. So yeah, it probably will create a second test record, but that also is, uh, that means that this, the teachers who are administrating the test are not trained properly. So that is, it's on the LEAs. Thanks. Um, and then yes, Spanish is only available for summative. Um, Karen, can you say the Braille again? You have to set the Braille and there was another step volume cut out. Tracy, do you mind explaining that one more time? Yes. Okay. So if you have students that need Braille, you first set Braille as your language. And then below that is Braille type. So that would be the Braille code the student is using. So your teachers of the visually impaired would help with that. Um, there's different Braille codes that students can choose from. And then you have to turn on the print on request. Um, and it's, you know, choosing either just the stimuli or the items. We always suggest anytime you're turning on print on request, regardless, to always do items and stimuli. So just setting Braille in language does not get you all of the things that you need, if that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, this isn't going to show up in Tide, but I wanted to bring attention to what it looks like for students in the testing environment with that Spanish adaptive version. So once that's applied, you'll see that little globe appear as a, as a global tool that the student can toggle between the English and Spanish once it's been applied. If the Spanish adaptive version has not been applied in Tide, that little globe is going to not be there. <laughs> it's not going to be available, okay? Um, finally, also under the student menu is the frequency distribution report. This report is available at the LEA or school level. The results can be displayed in like a grid or a graph, but it's going to allow you to um, show the number of students in specific categories, okay, which is, uh, can be kind of helpful. Um, Tracy talked a little bit about this too, but we're going to go into more information, more detail about what you need to do for students who require assistive technology or scribe, okay? When you do this, you are going to make the request to USBE through TIDE using the forms menu in the preparing for testing section. Okay, this is going to alert USBE and it will require approval. So on the TIDE dashboard, an LEA or a school level user is gonna click on forms and then click submit forms. 
On the next page, you're going to select the type of form you wish to submit. You can select request form as applicable to the accommodation being requested. Um, it's recommended that if you have students who are using dictation or speech to text, that you fill out the scribe request form, not the assistive technology request form, as it just has uh, more specific information to what is required. For assistive technology requests, you'll complete the form detailing the demographic information of the school, as well as the requirement of the accommodation. All sections of the form have to be completed prior to submission. And once you complete it, you have to agree that the accommodation is documented, used regularly and with fidelity in classroom instruction, and has been attempted in a training test to ensure it functions as expected for the student. So if you agree, you click the I agree checkbox and click submit. Um, it's important to know that upon submission, a tracking identifier will also be provided for you. Uh, it's recommended that you save this identifier to easily track the status of your accommodations request. Okay, once you submit a request, it can't be edited or changed. Your requests that you make will be reviewed by USBE staff and upon approval, the staff members will enable those requested accommodations in Tide. If you have any questions regarding accommodations, you can direct them to Jessica Wilhelm, our special education specialist. Um, before we move forward, Tracy, is there anything else, Tracy or Jessica, anything else you want to talk about with accommodations? No, so I just want to remind you, so teachers are not allowed to submit those um, accommodations request forms anymore. Those are at um, um, a district level. Um, we need to get clarification. I don't know if I saw Colin on here, um, if it's at the school level too, but teachers cannot submit those. So definitely um, assessment directors, you know, contact your assessment director on who is the appropriate person to submit that information. Thanks. So once you submit your requests, you can then review them. To do that on the TIDE dashboard, you'll click on forms in that same preparing for testing group and click the view or edit forms. On the next page, there's a search box that's displayed. Um, any field denoted with the asterisk is required to fill out, okay? Then you select and input any of the relevant search uh, settings based on your submitted accommodation form, click search, and the status of the form matching the selected search criteria are then going to be displayed for you. This step is optional, but if you want to view further details about the request, you can click on the little pencil icon uh, on the left of the form, and it will bring up significantly more information for you to review. Okay. So now on to rosters. The rosters tab allows you to search pre existing rosters. You can create, edit, and delete user-defined rosters, and you can view system-defined rosters. Um, sometimes we get the question, why would somebody want a user-defined roster? So if a teacher works with students receiving special ed services, that teacher may want to create a roster with those students who might be on a system-defined roster with another teacher. Uh, this can also be really helpful in co-teaching situations as well. Um, remember that system defined rosters cannot be edited. They are loaded through the Utrecht sync. If you are experiencing rostering issues, please reach out to our data specialist uh, who works with Utrecht and our syncing systems here, Maureen Rushing. She's wonderful and she can help you with any issues um, that you might be having with rostering. If you are interested in creating a user defined roster, you'll want to add a roster and then search for the students that you wish to have populate that roster. You'll then name the roster, select the teacher or other school personnel you'd like associated with that roster, select the students you want to add, and then use the add or remove icons to edit. When you're finished, you just save and continue. You can also create user-defined rosters in a more bulk method um, by uploading rosters to do that you'll need to fill out the template and then have it uploaded in Tide, okay? You verify that the information is there and then upload it as necessary. All of this is included in the uh, Tide user guide as well. Uh, for testing windows, many of you have already created your windows for benchmarks and interims, which is great. If you haven't, I would strongly recommend doing so. You will be able to set your summative window when it opens November 1st. 
Okay. Um, we've had a lot of questions about why don't I see the math interim available yet? It's because it's not available yet. So you won't see it in your window. Okay. Um, to set windows, you'll log into Tide and in the orange section, select the add test windows. Um, note that these windows can be edited at any time as well, if that's needed. Okay. You'll enter the required information at the top of the panel and then select the tests by either clicking the checkbox or clicking the little addition icon, little plus next to the test name. And you can add it for availability to the window uh, and click add selected to move them from available test names to selected test names. Then you just click save and create the test window. Um, Sydney, the math interim is available September 19th. That was in, I think it was like slide five. Yep. And if you don't want to create your testing windows manually, you can also use the file upload process. Guidance for how to do this is included in the best practices for using test windows document. And there's a template required and it's linked below that. Okay. It's important to set your testing windows so that tests especially summative tests, aren't taken or administered in error. Okay, by setting the windows when a teacher goes to administer a test, only the ones you've chosen to make available during that time will appear as options. When all is said and done, you should have created three separate windows, your summative window, your interim window, and your benchmark window. Okay. The last drop down option we'll look at under preparing for tests is the participation code drop down. Participation codes are used by USBE mostly for summative tests, but there is an exception for this when it comes to interims and benchmarks, and that's the parental exclusion participation code um, because it can be entered for any assessment. So to add a participation code to a student, you'll search for the student using the filters. Click search and then the search results table will show the students who match the search criteria that you entered. Uh, the participation code column lists any currently assigned participation codes. To edit those, you'll select the little pencil next to the student whose participation code you want to update. And then the edit non-participation code page is going to appear. Then you'll select the desired code from the drop-down menu for each test requiring that that participation code be added. Um, as a quick note here, if for some reason a student isn't appearing on a roster, I would recommend checking their parental exclusion status because sometimes we forget or didn't know that a code was already added to a student, thus rendering them ineligible for testing. They're not going to show up on a roster. Okay, so if you just have like one kid missing, double check this just to make sure um, before reaching out because this is one of those easy fixes that you can check. Okay. Do we have now at this point any question regarding the resources like the Tide user guide or the TAM, rostering, adding accommodations or participation codes? Does the code follow the student if they move schools or districts? Christine, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. But if you want to send me an email with it, I will be sure that we get you an answer. I don't believe it follows them, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, Brian, I missed where we add accommodations. Could you show that again? It's just under the student settings. You would edit with the pencil. And Brian, this is being recorded. And so you can go back and view the accommodations specific section. Yep. Any other questions? for these four topics before we move on. I just wanna make sure that we get you all taken care of. Okay, if something comes up, drop it in the chat or come off mute. So the test administration tab is where proctors and teachers or anyone really administering a test is going to go to prepare and manage their live testing sessions, okay? So before you conduct any testing, I'd recommend going through this checklist to ensure that all of your bases are covered. Um, first off, if you have any questions regarding the standard test administration and testing ethics policy training, please reach out to Kim Rathke, our testing coordinator. Um, I would also recommend that you review the TAM, make sure you have all of your scripts ready to read, 
um, ensure that the devices students are going to be able to use, support, testing are in, are in working order. This includes keyboards, computer mice, headphones. Uh, make sure students have taken a training test at some point prior to any administration that you do for a benchmark, interim, or summative. Uh, check your rosters, print your testing tickets if you plan to use those. Make sure students who require accommodations have those appropriate settings applied. Uh, I would also recommend you take into account the classroom or the location environment where your students are testing. Eliminate distracting noises. Um, do not play music during standardized assessments. <laughs> Cover or remove any materials that are going to provide hints or answers to questions. If possible, you may even want to arrange the classroom in a way that prevents students from viewing other computer screens. Um, you'll also want to notify your students of the electronic device policy prior to administration that no electronic devices are allowed during testing. That would include like cell phones, smartphones, smartwatches, internet capable devices, okay, with the exception of a handheld calculator if it's on the student's IEP or the device for students who might be using it to track. Um, a medical, uh, a medical uh, concern of some sort. Those are the only exceptions to that rule. Okay. If you uh, have elected to use testing tickets, there's a few places you can access them. However, the print test tickets option from the Green Administering Test section is really the easiest place. Accessing the test tickets from other locations does require a few more steps. So we're just going to focus on the quickest and easiest way today. After you select the print test tickets drop down, you will see the print from roster list where you'll be prompted to use the drop down menus for roster type and teacher name uh, to create the list. Okay, from there, you'll be able to select the section you wish to print, and the printer icon becomes available. It illuminates for when you're able to print those from your device. Okay. The remaining drop downs under the administering test menu, like the monitoring test progress and appeals, um, as well as after testing uh, the blue section, they become more important when we get to the summative administration. So we're going to look at those more closely um, during the training that's held in the winter as we prep for that summative administration. So now we're going to move to the actual test administration. Okay, As a reminder, the test administration manual is located in the resource section at the top. But to open a testing session, you'll need to select the test administration system option. These are the same six steps for any RISE test or benchmark module. Okay, Two proctors are best for test security. They do not need to be certified teachers, but they do need to have gone through the appropriate testing ethics training. Okay. The first step in administering any test is to create the session. This should be done fewer than 20 minutes prior to starting the test in order to prevent the system from timing out. The list of students in the session is going to generate automatically once students log in. When you first log in to the test administration screen um, and you select the test type from the window, it's going to automatically appear so that you can create those sessions. Uh, and new this year, in our continued effort to prevent the administration, the misadministration rather, of a summative assessment, this new important box will appear. It says, you are about to select a summative test. Students have only one opportunity to take this test. Click OK to continue. If you really want to administer this, please type summative. Okay. We experienced quite the uptick administration in misadministrations last year due to users not really paying attention to which tests they were selecting. So we're hopeful that this new feature will encourage users to be a little more cognizant of their selections, but also kind of serve as that red flag warning before moving forward because they have to type summative. So in their head, they might be thinking, why would I type summative? I'm trying to administer a benchmark. That's what we're hoping for, <laughs> okay? So when you go to make your test selection, um, the windows are color coded for the available tests and they're organized into categories. Um, you can click the plus sign button next to a category name to view the test in a category. You can also click one or more specific tests to administer from the category. Um, students are only gonna have access to the tests you include in the session and that they are eligible to take. 
After you select the tests that you are going to administer, you're going to go to the reason for the session drop down menu, select a reason, and then you can click the start session button to start the testing session. The test delivery system does, uh, it's gone through some enhancements recently, so it does look slightly different than it has in years past. So once you click that start session button, the system will automatically generate a session ID. The ID is going to appear at the top of the screen along with a stop button. The first portion of the session ID where you actually see UAT in this screenshot will either say train or training tests or live or benchmarks, interims, and summative tests. This session ID needs to be provided to students in order for them to log in. Uh, you may want to write it on the board for easy reference. Um, you may also want to note that session ID for your own records, just in case you accidentally close your browser, because entering the session ID will allow you to resume the session without interrupting uh, when students taking the test, if that happens. Um, when students start signing into the test session, the approvals button will then appear next to the session ID. Once you approve students for testing, the session table will appear in the center of the screen, which will display students' testing progress. And we're going to discuss more about that in later slides. Uh, now we're going to look at the banner in its entirety. Okay, as like I said before, it's had a little bit of a facelift, so it looks a little bit different than it has in the past. In the banner at the top of the window, you'll see a set of buttons and your username. The student lookup tab is to search for student login information and verify that the credentials are correct. Uh, you can click the approved requests to view a list of students print requests that you've approved during the test session. You can click print session if you want to print a screenshot of this screen. The help guide is a link in the upper right and that allows you to access additional information about the test administration interface. You can also click the log out button under your account to exit the test administration screen. So that student lookup tab that I just showed you on the last slide is helpful if a student is having trouble logging in because you can verify that the student's login credentials are correct. You can uh, use either the quick search or the advanced search option to view the information entered for the student in Tide. With quick search, you simply enter the SSID and click submit SSID. Advanced search is going to allow you to narrow it using several filters like district, school, grade, first name, last name. Um, when using either of these two search options, if there's any matches, the information is going to appear in the bottom of the window. If there's no match, you're going to see an error message. So if you do see the student you're looking for, you can click on the little eye icon next to the student name. A new window is going to display with the student information included. And just know that the information displayed may vary slightly from what's shown here, but you get the general idea of what you will see when you click on that little eyeball to verify the student login information. Once you start the session and students have successfully logged in, you have to approve their test settings before they can access their tests. Um, it's important you pay close attention to the test name prior to approval, just to be sure students have selected the appropriate test. To approve students for testing, you click the approvals button next to the session ID. A list of students is going to display a, and it's gonna organize it by the test name. Okay. You'll want to review the list just to make sure that all the students chose the correct content area and the correct test. Ensure that all the settings for the students are correct. This is again done using the little eyeball button in the see details column. If no changes are needed, you can select the approve all students to admit all students in the session. Um, if a student selected an incorrect test, you'll want to deny that student entry simply by clicking the little X in the action column. Even though you can approve all students at the same time, students have to be individually denied entry. Um, you might be wondering why you would deny a student entry. It would be if the student's not supposed to enter the session, if the demographic information is incorrect, um, if the required accommodations have not been set. Those are all really great reasons to deny a student entry. Just know that if you deny a student entry to a test, it's not going to prevent other approved students from beginning their tests. So. Um, if the student settings are incorrect, the settings need to be updated in Tide before the student can take the test. Um, that means you probably need to reach out to your test coordinator or possibly even a district test coordinator to have the settings updated because it's going to prevent them from having the correct accommodations applied. 
If they have already started the test, you'll have to create a test appeal to reset the test for the student later if they didn't have the appropriate accommodations, okay? Note that no setting can be changed while the student is actively testing. Once the student begins, settings like the language option cannot be changed without resetting the test opportunity, okay? Updates to things like background color or font size will only take effect after the student logs out and resumes from like logging back in after it's been fixed or, um, or changed. Once students log in and are approved, test administrators will then monitor the status using this table. The table shows student information, the test name, the opportunity number, progress, test status, test settings, and actions. Um, the progress column displays the student progress through items on a test. It might display like a progress bar or show the number of total items that have been completed. The test settings column is going to display either standard or custom. This column um, will display custom only if a student's test settings are different from the default settings for that test. And if you wanna verify those customized settings, you just click the little eyeball. The actions column also allows you to pause a student's test from, um, like from the teacher side, from your side. Uh, if TDS detects that a student might be having some sort of technical issue or requires assistance, a test with potential issues table is going to uh, bump to the top of the screen above the test without issue table. And then a more info icon will appear in the test status column. And when you hover over that icon, it's going to display more information about the issue, um, whether the student needs um, a printout or something like that. If, it's a, if the student's requesting a printout, a printer icon will actually appear in the actions column as well. And that print on request feature is available only for students who require it per their IEP or 504 plan, okay? Before um, you approve the student's print request, you'll wanna ensure that it's being sent to a printer that's being monitored by staff who have been trained in test security purely because all printed test items, stimuli, reading passages, all of those things need to be securely stored and destroyed immediately following the test session. The approved requests button allows you to view a list of every print request you've approved during the session. Um, if you wish to print this list for your records, you can click print at the top of the print requests window. Um, if you wish to print a snapshot of the test administration screen in its current view, you can click the print session button. This is really useful for tracking students who didn't complete their tests and might need to schedule another session. Um, it might be necessary to set the page layout though to landscape or adjust the margins in your print preview screen, just so you know, so that it all fits on one page, okay? And just like with the print on request papers, this would be, still be considered um, secure testing information because it's also going to contain PII and student information. So it needs to be securely stored and destroyed following use. You have two options within the test administration interface to pause or stop testing once you've started. You can pause an individual student test or you can stop an entire session. To pause an individual student test, you just click the pause button that we looked at earlier in the actions column, okay? When prompted, you'll click okay to confirm that you want to pause the test. This option would be appropriate if a student becomes ill, for example, or if a student went to use the restroom in the middle of the test and maybe you didn't pause their test prior to leaving the room, you could pause it for them. Um, in the event of an emergency uh, that requires all students to stop testing, you can pause all student tests just by stopping the session. You don't need to click each individual student to pause, just click the stop option. Because um, if you click the stop session, all of the in-progress tests are going to be paused. If a session stops though, it can't be resumed, which basically just means that when you come back, you're going to need to create a new test session with a new ID, okay, for students to resume. Um, when you click the stop button, a pop-up message is going to appear requesting verification that you, are you sure you wanna stop and you can just click okay. Or if you clicked it in error, you can cancel it. Um, also, if you forget to log out, before leaving the testing area, the session is going to close automatically after 20 minutes of inactivity on both the test administration interface side as well as the student computers. 
So you would need to create a new session and provide the new session ID to students in order to resume testing in that type of situation as well. You can also transfer an active test session from one device or browser to another without stopping the session or interrupting uh, in progress tests. This is useful in scenarios um, when your computer malfunctions or possibly if a laptop battery is dying or if you accidentally close the browser while a session's in progress, your session still remains open until it times out. So if you don't return to the active session within 20 minutes and there's no student activity during that time, it's gonna log out and pause all those tests, okay? The online testing system ensures that you could administer only one test session from one browser at a time. So if you move the test session to a new device, you cannot simultaneously administer the same session from the original browser. So if this happens to you with like that laptop battery dies or something like that happens, don't log out or stop it. If you do, you're gonna end up um, ending the session, which is going to automatically pause all student tests, okay? While the session's still active on the device or browser, you're just gonna sign in to the test, in, test administration interface site again on a new device, choose the active session in the text box and just click join, okay? That's gonna allow you to continue monitoring your students' tests. Uh, the test session isn't going to be interrupted for students who are taking it. If, like I said before, if your laptop battery dies or if you accidentally close the browser, this is the way to fix that. Upon completion of a session, you'll just click the log out button in the upper right corner of the page. It's preferable for you to log out um, only after you stop your active session because logging out is going to cause any in-progress tests to be paused. Um, a confirmation message is going to appear asking you to confirm that yes, you want to exit the website and pause all students in-progress tests. Um, this scenario also occurs when you navigate to another website from the test administration interface. Uh, however, regardless of when or how you log out or navigate away from the page, student data is not going to be lost. Okay. If you end up needing to access another site during a test session, we encourage you to open it in a separate browser window. Uh, this table just presents some of the common issues that you and your students might encounter during a test session. For more detailed information and additional technical tips, um, I would recommend referring to the TAM as well as the Technical Specifications Manual for Online Testing. Again, these slides will be sent to participants in the next couple of days, so you'll have access to this. Now we're going to look at the secure browser student interface. So we looked at how teachers administer. Now we're going to look at how the student gets into the system. So you'll notice the first name, SSID, and session ID are all required for sign in. Students need to use the secure browser to log in. The secure browser is designed to ensure that test security occurs. It prohibits students from accessing any other programs or websites during testing. Okay, your school's technology coordinator is responsible for ensuring that the secure browser has been correctly installed on any testing device. So if you have questions about installation on the secure browser, contact your testing, not testing coordinator, your technology coordinator. So for students to log into the online testing system, they've got their secure browser on a separate computer or device than the one that's being used by the teacher. The students are going to enter their first name their SSID, the session ID that we talked about earlier, okay? Again, most people elect to write it on the board so it's easy to reference. And then when entries are complete, the student's gonna click the sign in button to log into the test. Um, test administrators can assist students with logging in if necessary. Once they're logged in, students need to complete a few more steps before they begin testing. They're gonna be asked to view and verify their personal information. If their information is correct, they should click yes, okay? If their information is incorrect, they would click no. This is gonna return them back to the login page, okay? You're gonna want to uh, talk with your school or district test coordinator if students' information needs to be updated and tied before they attempt to log in again. This is really important to pay attention to because some students have the same first and last names, okay? The grade, and the SSID have got to match, all right? We 
see it every once in a while where a student has the same first and last name as another student and they were given the wrong testing ticket because the SSID didn't match. So this is where a student can really verify that information before moving forward. On the Your Test screen, students are going to see a list of their assigned tests for the session. If the tests displayed are incorrect um, or the expected test to, test to take isn't listed, students can click the Back to Login uh, button to return to the login page. But if there's no errors, they can move forward as expected and they can se select the correct test. And then they're going to wait for that approval to proceed. OK, uh, just note this screenshot is for training tests, so it does look slightly different from benchmarks or interns or summatives. Once teachers have approved students for a session, the students are gonna see screens titled Choose Settings. This screen displays the name of the test and any selected accessibility resources. Um, if the information is correct, students should click Select. If any of the information is incorrect, they should click Go Back and wait for more instructions, okay? Teachers are going to read the required scripts that are located in the TAM to guide students through the login and confirmation process. After verifying their test, students will proceed through one or more functionality checks to make sure that the testing device is functioning properly. The functionality checks that appear will depend on the test that the student is taking. So these checks are great because this also allows for a headphones test before getting into the test itself. Um, just be sure that push that cord in all the way so it doesn't wiggle out and not everybody is hearing the, the voice pack reading to the entire class. Next, students have the opportunity to review detailed information about the tools and the navigation features that are going to be allowable during testing from the instructions and the help screen. So when students click begin test now, that's when they are presented with the first question of the test. Um, if a student is having difficulty logging in, an error message and a code are going to display on the login screen. The most common errors occur when the student's first name and SSID do not match what's in the system and when SSIDs are entered incorrectly. So if the student receives an error message indicating that the entered um, incorrect information in the first name or the SSID fields, your test administrator is going to want to use either the student lookup tool or the testing ticket to verify the student information. Um, another common error that occurs when students enter um, an incorrect session ID. So if a student receives the message, the session is not available for testing, just verify that the session ID was entered correctly with no spaces or extra characters. Sometimes that happens with the first name as well. Um, the session ID is gonna be found in the test administration interface, or like I said, if you have written it on the board, you can also double check that. If a student receives the error message that the session has expired, ensure that the student has entered the correct session ID for the current session, rather than one they may have used during the last class period and they thought that that's what it was. Okay. Um, finally, if administering a practice test, make sure that the test administrator and the student each use the appropriate practice site. So if you're administering an operational test, ensure that teachers are using the operational test administration site and that the student is using the secure browser rather than the guest login um, for, the, for the training test. So now we're going to explore the global tools and other features that are available for all students to use during testing. These tools and features um, are going to be discussed in detail on the following slides. So you can see that we're going to look in the upper right and the upper left corners of, of the screen for what a student sees. So the notepad allows students to make notes about an item. The notepad is item specific, so students can only access their notes for a question when they're on that question's test page. Notes will continue to be saved when students move on to the next segment or if their tests are paused. Okay, Test items with notes will display with a small notepad badge next to the item number. The notes tool, however, is not item specific. These notes are available throughout the entire test. So anything students type into the notes section is saved and continues to be accessible for later segments in a segmented test. The notes will also be retained if a student logs out and resumes testing later. Students can use the highlighter tool 
to mark text that they want to remember in reading passages, math stimuli, and in any text-based answer questions, such as those that ask a student to click a section of text to choose an answer. To do this, students must select the desired text, right-click, and then click highlight section that pops up. To remove the highlighting, the student then right-clicks in the area that's been highlighted, select the reset highlighting button that pops up, and if a student pauses the test, any highlighting made before pausing is going to be retained. It will still be there, okay? Um, the highlighter tool can also be accessed from the context menu. The strike through tool can be used to help students mark the answers they do not wish to choose for a particular question. Um, to do this, students right click on the text of the answer they want to mark and then click strike through as it comes up. The answer text will then display with a line through it. To remove that strike through, students can right click and then click the undo strike through button that pops up. Um, it's important to note though that striking through the answer does not indicate a response to the question. So just because they've removed three items doesn't mean it automatically marks the remaining response correct. The student still has to select the response to the question. Also, applying the strike through does not prevent the student from selecting that answer, okay, as a response. It just is a visual deterrent. Um, another element of the online test that helps students succeed is the mark for review feature. As they proceed through a test, students are required to answer each question on the screen before they can go on. So if they're unsure of an answer, they should provide what they think is the best answer because there's no penalty for guessing. And then students can mark that item to review before completing the test segment, okay? To mark an item for review, the student can open the context menu for an item and select mark for review. And the item number will display a little dog ear corner and a little small flag badge. For items with tabs, um, items marked for review are going to display the little dog ear. At any time during a test segment, students can then navigate back to the marked item within the segment and review it and change their answers as desired. Okay, this can be done either by clicking the back button in the navigation toolbar until they reach the desired item or by using the item drop down menu that's located in the upper left corner of the page to select a specific item. To unmark an item, the student can open the context menu from the item and select unmark review item. Um, note that once a student has completed a test segment in a test that prohibits navigation to previous segments, or if their test is paused for more than 20 minutes, returning to items marked for review is not allowed, okay? Um, that 20 minute rule, however, is not applicable to performance tasks, but just know if they fall, fall victim to that 20 minute pause rule, they won't be able to go back. Um, during testing, they can use the Zoom feature, okay? If they want it larger than the default size by zooming in, and then text can be returned to a smaller size using the zoom out. Um, just as a heads up, the default size for all tests is 14 point typeface. Um, so if desired prior to testing, a testing coordinator can increase the default text size for the entire test by setting the zoom level and tide. Um, the test administrator can also change the text size setting in the test administration interface during the approvals process if that's needed. Just note though that zoom levels beyond three times of the default size is going to require streamline mode to be enabled for the student. And the zoom tool is not the same as magnification, okay? Magnification is an option that students can access um, using their own assistive devices. So those are different. An English glossary feature is available for students to use in grades three through five on ELA passages and some items during testing. Um, the student can access the glossary by clicking on any of the pre-selected terms that are indicated on the screen with a gray dotted outline. When the student hovers the mouse over the term, it's gonna highlight it in blue. And if the student clicks the highlighted term, term a pop-up box is gonna appear with the definition of the term. And students can return to the item by clicking the X in the upper right corner of the pop-up box to close that little glossary. The masking tool allows students to cover up any distracting area of the test page. To use this tool, students click the masking button 
and then click and drag their mouse to select a rectangular area on the screen. To deactivate masking mode, the student has to click the masking button again. Okay, masked areas are gonna remain on the screen even after masking mode is deactivated. To remove the masked area, the student has to click in the little X button in the upper right corner that will appear in the masked area. The select previous version tool allows students to view and restore responses that they previously entered and saved for a text response item. To use this tool, students open the context menu for a text response item and select select previous version. A window is gonna appear listing any saved responses for that item and any of the text associated with each one. To view previous responses, the student can select a response version in the left panel and read the associated text in the right panel. To restore the selected response, the student can click select at the bottom of the window. Um, the selected response will then appear in the answer area for the item. Note that the select previous version tool cannot restore responses though that were entered prior to pausing a test that has fallen victim to the pause rule. Um, if your school chooses to test over multiple days, you may wish to have students pause their tests at a certain point so that they can resume testing at another time. You may also allow a pause if students are taking a break from testing or if they need to leave the room for any reason. Um, whether they've been instructed to do so or not, students have the ability to pause their test at any time by clicking the pause button in the upper left corner of the screen. When they do so, a pop-up message will appear asking them to confirm that they want to pause the test. Um, the student can click yes or no, depending on the desired result. Um, here's that pause rule that I've talked about. We're gonna look at this in a little more detail because sometimes it's confusing because rules apply when students pause their test, depending on the type of test and how long the pause lasts. So for all tests that have been paused for less than 20 minutes, students returning from a break in testing can revisit any item in the current test segment and change their answers if desired. This is if it's been paused for less than 20 minutes, okay? Students taking all tests except writing who have paused their tests for longer than 20 minutes may only return to the most recently visited page containing unanswered test items in the current test segment. Okay, they may change any answers present on this page, but they're not going to be able to access items on a previous page if the test was paused longer than 20 minutes. If all items on the most recently visited page were answered prior to pausing, the student will resume the test on the next page with unanswered items and then will not be allowed to access previous pages or the segment of the test. Okay. This can get confusing. If you have questions, let me know, but just as a general rule of thumb, less than 20 minutes, they can still access everything they've already answered. More than 20 minutes, that is not going to be the case anymore. Um, as a security measure, after 20 minutes of test inactivity, students are logged out and their tests are paused automatically. Um, inactivity is determined by whether or not the student is interacting with the test by like selecting answers, using the navigation tools. Um, clicking empty space on the screen is not considered activity. <laughs> so just be aware of that. Students will receive a warning message though prior to being logged out and they have to click OK on that pop-up message within 30 seconds in order to avoid automatic logout and pausing of their test. Um, if a student's test is paused due to inactivity, the same rules are going to apply as when the student intentionally pauses the test. So the student can log back into the test and resume from that point where they were interrupted subject to the pause rule if it's applicable. Um, additionally, if a screensaver is activated during testing, the security breach feature is going to automatically log the student out of the test. So to avoid any of those types of interruptions, um, you're gonna want to either deactivate screen screensavers before students start or ensure that the screensaver is set to more than the allocated testing time so that you don't run into that issue. The math grade six interim and summative tests are presented in segments. When students reach the end of uh, the test segment, they're gonna receive a warning message asking them to confirm that they want to move on to segment number two, okay? The warning also advises that they cannot return to change their answers in the current segment once they've moved on. So teachers and test administrators, 
you you want to just ensure that students understand the outcome of ending a segment and encourage students to check their answers before moving on. Okay, the test administrator will also need to approve the student before they can enter segment two, um, because it includes the calculator global tool for segment two. Um, when students answer the final question on the test, the end test button will appear in the upper left section of the screen, along with a message advising them that the test has been completed and is ready to be submitted. The end test button does not become visible until the student has selected at least one response to every question on the test. If a student clicks the next button at this point, they're going to see a pop up message advising them to click the end test button when they've completed reviewing their answers. Um, they may also click the back button to go back and revisit previous items. Again, subject to the pause rule if it's been applied during the testing session. For the writing tests, test administrators, please be sure that students have completed the entire task before submitting their test. If students are taking a break during the writing test, they need to pause their test rather than clicking end. Okay, the end test button will appear on the screen as soon as the student starts answering the prompt, okay? But don't instruct them to click it until the student's ready to finish and submit. So when students are ready to end, they can click the end test button. A pop-up is going to appear allowing them to uh, click yes if they're ready to finish or no if they're not. If a student clicks no, it's gonna uh, return them to the last item of the test so that they can revisit previous items. But if the student clicks yes, they're gonna be taken to a review screen where they have the choice to review their answers or submit the test. Their ability to review and change answers is still subject to that pause rule if applicable. Students who are ready to submit can click submit test to finish. They're gonna receive a confirmation pop-up message asking if yes, they're sure they want to, clicking no, We'll return them now to the review screen. Clicking yes is going to take them to the test completion page, which shows a message indicating that the test was successfully submitted and advises the student to log out. Um, this is also a great time to have some set procedures in place, like having students notify the test administrator before submission. Um, the TAM has specific directions for ending tests. If you have a click happy kiddo who submits a writing test before they're finished, just know it can be reopened. It just has to be done through a test appeal. This was a lot of information in this section. Do we have questions on testing tickets, how to administer, how students access, or the tools that students can use while they're accessing the test? Again, you can drop them in the chat or you can come off mute. Okay, I'm gonna go on to reporting. There's no questions. <laughs> if something comes up, you know what to do. So with reporting, it's the very last component that's provided for you on the RISE portal. When you log into the reporting system, the first thing you see is the dashboard where you can view overall assessment results for all of your assessments listed by assessment, okay? Teachers can also view a list of their students. Uh, the dashboard generator allows the user to determine which types of test groups they would like to start with, as well as being able to default these selections for subsequent logins. The screen will also allow quick searching for specific SSIDs, as well as changing various settings in the features and tools menu, like changing reporting time period to look at historical RISE data um, or to download student results, um, as well as other functionality. So once you've selected the test groups in any relevant settings, you're gonna click the green go to dashboard button at the bottom to proceed. And the selections chosen can be changed at any time by using the dashboard generator link that's at the top left of the screen. Um, I see a question in the chat. Speaking of reporting, are last year's summative test scores finalized? What do you mean by finalized? What shows up in RISE is definitely their score, but are you talking about What's oh, in just, reporting or what's on like the, da the data gateway? On my understanding that, you know, you get a score, but then, you know, in the summer, there might be some tweaks. It's like, oh, a lot of kids got this one wrong. We're going to take it out. Um, is that true? 
So anything that's in Rise reporting is like it's done deal. Okay. Um, but I do know that there are like various business rules and things that are applied after through the data gateway. But if you have questions on what appears there, you'll want to reach out to Aaron Bruff, who's over data and statistics. Okay, got it. Okay. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Um, it's important to note also that the teacher dashboard and the school and admin or LEA dashboard do look slightly different. Um, so users can see overall test results directly from this dashboard page. This screen also, also shows the filter panel on the left-hand side. It uh, is expanded to show options that are available to the user. If you're not initially seeing information you believe you should be seeing, check your filters. <laughs> Oftentimes it's just because these are set to view a specific set of data, which could be excluding what you're looking for. So for example, right now, if I were to log into RISE reporting, mine defaults to summative. I do not have um, benchmarks or interims selected. Okay, that might be the case for you as well. So if you're looking for benchmark or interim results, you will want to double check that you have them selected to pull those in your filter. Um, to view school level results as an LEA user, you'll select the desired test from the list and then select the school you wish to view. And then you can use the arrows across the top to sort by student count, completion rate, as well as the scale score. If you're wanting to search for previous year's RISE data, you'll need to choose the reporting time period that you desire for like which school year and then determine which students you want to view because you can view your current students, like your previous, your, um, you can view your current students or your previous students. So if I wanna view my current students, the ones that are sitting in my classroom right now, but I wanna know what they got on their RISE tests last year, I wanna keep the date set to today, okay? But if I want to view performance for my last year kiddos, on last year's test, I'm gonna set the date to a day when the students were associated with me at that time and had started testing. Um, the performance by roster tab will display assessment results for each class. Users can sort roster level data uh, by using the performance arrows. The first few arrows also show aggregate performance data for your LEA school and total students. And these filters can be applied for the type of test, a reason, school, standards, it just depends on the screen, okay? On the performance by roster tab, you can view and expand various tabs of leveled data for schools or teachers or different rosters. Um, after expanding an applicable tab for benchmarks and interims, you'll just wanna click on the blue links at the top of each of the column to view any additional data. On this screen, it's also possible to view and expand various tabs of classroom level data such as viewing the top five best or five worst items for a given benchmark, or by viewing the total items available in a benchmark, okay? After expanding an applicable tab for the benchmarks or interims, you can click on the blue links at the top of each column um, to view additional data, including the answers and rubrics um, that are utilized for scoring. Again, this is only available for benchmarks and interims. This is not available for summative. Okay, the item level reporting data. Um, this method will also allow for sharing and viewing of rubrics um, without revealing the individual student scores. Um, you can view your student performance in each area of the benchmark by clicking that reporting category section and expanding them. You can see individual items here. So I can click on item one, item two, item three, see how students um, responded. Scores are gonna be shown as raw scores. And a raw score is just a summary of how many points the student received based on how many answers um, they answered correctly or how many questions they answered correctly. You can also use the breakdown by feature to compare performance between various demographic subgroups that are listed here by selecting the appropriate boxes. And these can be downloaded to PDFs, zips, CSV formats, as well as other types of student results. Same thing, they can be downloaded. Um, they can also be printed, okay? When it comes to scoring um, a benchmark module, it 
is as follows. A raw score is a summary of how many points the student received based on how many questions they answered correctly. And you're going to see the performance distribution is given using standards. So if a student is above standard, the confidence range of the student's score is above the proficiency cut score, meaning there is confidence that the student is proficient in the reporting category that was assessed. Um, if a student is at or near standard, the confidence range in the student's score includes the proficiency cut score, meaning the student may or may not be proficient in the reporting category that was assessed, and maybe a little more investigation is needed at that point. Um, if a student is below standard, the confidence range of the student's score is below the proficiency cut score, meaning there is confidence that the student is not proficient in that reporting category that was assessed. Again, this is specific to benchmark module reporting. For interim and summative assessments, they cover multiple reporting categories. And as a result, the following is shown in the reporting system for interim assessments, okay? So scores for interim are shown as scale scores. And a scale score makes it possible to compare one student's score to another student's score, even if they didn't respond to the same questions, okay? Performance distribution is given using proficiency levels. Proficiency levels describe how your student applied their content-specific knowledge and skills as outlined in the core standards demonstrated through the, like the statewide assessment. So then we've got our four separate categories for this one with below proficient, approaching, proficient, and then highly proficient, okay? Um, finally, longitudinal reporting is available to show growth over time whenever you see that little climbing arrow icon. Uh, longitudinal reports are available at all levels, um, district, school, class, um, and students for interim and summative assessments. The longitudinal reports, though, are not available for benchmarks. Okay. Do we have any questions specific to reporting? I have a question, uh, but I wanted to, to see the score from my school, and the roster wasn't prepared, it was only by grade level. Yeah, I got checked in the morning and it was fixed, so I was about to make that report, but uh, when I check in the morning, now every, new, every teacher has uh, their own uh, roster, so now it's fixed. Do they fix it a monthly or what happened? Because for one month, it was only one big roster. So there were some, we were experiencing some rostering issues earlier this month that have caused some rosters to not roster appropriately. We do believe that it is fixed now. So everything should be as expected. But Homer, if you um, go to find a roster that's not there, just reach out to myself and Maureen and, and we can start investigating as to why it might not be there. Awesome, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Any other questions for reporting? The last slide just includes the RISE Help Desk information. There is an email option as well as a phone number. I've included the hours of operation as well as the summative window hours because they do change. Um, and with that, my friends, we are done. So if you have questions, please feel free to stay on and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. But if you're done and good to go, you are welcome to sign off. Again, this was recorded. We will get it posted to our assessment YouTube channel, um, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, but I hope to be able to share the link with you in next week's AD meeting so that you can uh, uh, reference it as needed. And then the slides will also be sent to you by the end of the week as well. Again, if you want to stay on and ask questions, by all means, please do. Christine, you are welcome. Again, you can come off mute or drop anything in the chat. Happy to help. Hey, question I had. Um, I know back in the SAGE era, we were able to make our own assessments from pulling from a pool. Um, 
you know, whereas the benchmarks are set, they're kind of like in stone and the benchmarks don't really align with our curriculum really well. They'll, they'll kind of like take something from chapter one and chapter seven or something like that. Is there any possibility of, yeah, self-creating using Anything those for self-created is going to be done through the UTIP system. Okay. Are we, um, is this slide deck going to be available for us to refer back to? Yes. Emily will be e emailing out in the next couple of days. So it's not going to be like right after this today, but it will be emailed along with um, the link to the recording. Also, I have a question that's specific. Is Jessica Wilhelm in this meeting? She is. Maybe I'll just, oh, I had a question about the Braille. Do I need to? I our um I just talked to our sped director and we want both the scribe and the assistive technology. Is that possible? Can we get both accommodations for the rise? Yeah, I'm gonna let Tracy answer this question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I can jump in. Um so it's just assumed that when you have students using Braille that they will use a scribe because the way it works is you will print um, on site those Braille files and the test administrator, you'll still log in under the student computer, under the student computer, like on their login, and the test administrator enters the student's responses because it's still adaptive. So what we need to do, I'm going to get you a link and put it in the chat. What you need to do is fill out the Braille request form for us so that we can get you um, on our radar. And, and especially with RISE, there is, um, there is a lot of steps to doing that. And in fact, I'm going to give you this link and then will you email me? We are actually doing a TVI, Teachers of the Visually Impaired Training. Uh, tomorrow. Today's Wednesday, right? Tomorrow. And we are going to walk through RISE testing. So whoever in your school is going to possibly be administering Braille, it would be good for them to attend that. But perfect. Yep. And then, and then, oh, I think Sammy, we worked with you last year, correct? Yes. Yes. Because she was a third grader. So, I, I mean, I, I just want to make sure it was, we were super stressed out about it last year. So I kind of want to you yep. know. So get that Braille. So I put the link in there um, to the accommodations page where that request form is. You can get that filled out, submitted to us. Um, and then my email is there. Email me so that I can get you the link to that training we're doing tomorrow. Um, and even if it's you that attends or somebody, it will be really beneficial. Um, okay, sounds if, good. If there is anybody else on here that needs, um, know you have Braille users and you need some extra support, you can email me as well and we can get you that link. Um, we are working with USDB's teachers um, tomorrow, but anybody can come and we're going to walk through some Braille stuff. Okay, thanks so much. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Again, you can come off mute. I actually have a few direct message questions that are the same, so I'm just gonna address them right here. Um, I have a couple of people asking if you can review benchmark questions as a class from the reporting section, as long as student data isn't showing on the projector. Yes, um, it has to be done through the reporting section um, after all students have taken uh, the benchmark. And if you want guidance more specific, I'm happy to provide that for you. Just send me an email and I can get you the little slide deck that I have. But it's also outlined in um, the reporting guide. It provides it there. Okay. And I put my email in the chat if you need to email me something directly. Any other questions?
All right, then with that, um, Jerry, we can go ahead and close the Zoom and stop the recording. Thank you so much for your help. Participants, thank you so much for attending. If you need anything,